I like explosive volcanoes. I like to understand the dynamics of why they explode and what happens during their eruptions and uh, the hazards associated with them. So today I'm going to be talking about Mount St. Helens. Um, and like, uh, like she said, I'm going to start with just, uh, I'm going to kind of start out with just kind of an informal discussion. I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to kind of pick your brain a little bit about what you think about these kinds of eruptions, why some eruptions are explosive or non-explosive. Uh, and then I'll go into about a 20-minute presentation where I kind of just go through and describe the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Um, and then we'll break and, and do a, a Q&A session. So, uh, so yeah, just to give you a, a kind of an outline then, we're going to start with explosive versus non-explosive eruptions. And you guys are going to tell me how you get one versus the other. Um, what explosive eruptions in beer have in common, which <laughs> surprisingly quite a lot. <laughs> so yeah, then I'll give maybe a 20 minute presentation on the eruption of Mount St. Helens. I'm going to show you some videos that describe some of these processes so you really understand them a little bit better. And then we'll have our discussion. So with that, uh, these are some discussion topics that you might want to keep in the back of your head. Uh, that a lot of people might be interested in when thinking about explosive eruptions, especially given where we live in Washington. Um, so planning and understanding for dangers of volcanic eruptions, um, the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980, what did we learn from that to help us prepare for other eruptions in the Cascades? Uh, how do we get ash clouds? What are they and how do they work? And uh, you know, what does this mean for the other Cascade volcanoes? All right, so to start, I'm sure all of you are familiar with those nice videos or pictures of lava flows in Hawaii, right? And you're probably also very familiar with the fact that we can have incredibly explosive eruptions. So my question to you is why do you think, what controls whether or not you get a non-explosive eruption that might have something like a lava flow versus an explosive eruption that's going to produce a heck of a lot of ash and destruction? Mm-hmm. Yep, so that's, okay. Yep. Right, so she says that with Mount St. Helens, it built to a point where it finally just exploded, whereas Hawaii is erupting all the time. It's, it's a pretty mild volcano. There's always lava just oozing out of the ground non-explosively, and people like me go and poke sticks in it. Um, <laughs> So that's, that's, that's very true. So, but what, what caused the eruption of Mount St. Helens to, to really build up? Yeah, it was blocked, right? So all this magma was coming up on the surface and pressure was building. So I'm going to give you a hint. We'll try not to destroy any equipment up here. I, uh, I brought a couple of things in. I brought a couple bottles of water because I get thirsty a lot during these talks. And so I've got a, I went over next door and I got just a, just a normal bottle of water here. And then I got some fizzy water. Sometimes I kind of like to have a little fizz in my water. So if we use the analogy of Hawaii is the normal bottle of water with no fizz and, and Mount St. Helens is the fizzy water. So, um, you know, sometimes I, I forget that this is water, the fizzy water, and sometimes I like to shake my other water and I go to open it and what happens? I didn't, right. So why? Why did it, why did, would this one? Release carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. <laughs> exactly. So there's gas in this, whereas there's no gas in that. So the exact same thing with volcanic eruptions. There's gas in these explosive eruptions, and that's why they're explosive. And there's no gas in those, those non-explosive eruptions in Hawaii. And that's exactly right, what you said, though. Because of the gas, because this magma is coming up, it's building up, there's all this gas, there's pressure, and finally, boom, it explodes uh, to form something like Mount St. Helens. Um, so just to kind of show you, there's different types of these non-explosive eruptions. You get the ones like you have in Hawaii, which is lava flows uh, oozing across the surface. Sometimes you get these things called lava domes, and these are non-explosive. You just have this kind of thicker, colder lava coming up out of a vent, and it, it can't flow very far because it's so thick and sticky. So it just stays right there in the vent and fills it in. And the reason I wanted to make that distinction is because this is exactly what happened in Mount St. Helens after the 1980 explosive eruption. After that gas was let off, then 
this lava just kind of oozed up in the crater and formed this lava dome. So this is a type of non-explosive eruption. With explosive eruptions, then, you can get a range of styles depending on how much gas is in the magma. So if there's just a little bit of gas in the magma, you might get one of these really pretty fountains of lava kind of squirting up, and you might see people kind of walking up close to it with paper, uh, newspapers over their head, which is kind of a silly thing to do, but I've seen it. Um, <laughs> Uh, Strom there's Stromboli and there's Mount Etna, and both of them have this exact same kind of activity. Yeah. Um, and this is called Stromboli, and after that kind of activity, exactly. Uh, then you have kind of a little bit more explosive eruptions, and then you get all the way up into these incredibly explosive eruptions. This is an example of Chai Ten in Chile, which just started erupting not too long ago. And this is the kind of eruption that we had at Mount St. Helens, a very explosive eruption. So. What happens during an explosive eruption? So before I get into all this stuff, I kind of want to make sure that all of us kind of are on the same page as far as how these things work. And this is where our famous beer analogy comes in. So I hope that everybody has your fizzies, maybe some sodas or perhaps some beer. And essentially what happens is that you've got this magma chamber. So this is just, an, just a, a cartoon, if you will got a volcano and you've got this magma chamber down here and you've got this this magma rising to the surface so at these really great pressures or sorry at these really great depths you have a lot of pressure you're under a lot of pressure just like if you would swim to the bottom of a 10 or 15 foot swimming pool you can feel your ears kind of feel like they're caving in a little bit so you can imagine if you went you know two miles down into the earth how much pressure you'd be under well at these great pressures gases are dissolved Okay, you can st use the same analogy. I know you can't really see the water in here, but right now this is under pressure. There's no, you can't even see any bubbles in this. But as soon as I open that cap, it's gonna start bubbling, right? Because I've just released the pressure. So when you start releasing pressure, bubbles start to form. So there's gas in that magma, and it starts to rise because it's, it's, it's buoyant, it's less dense than the surrounding rocks, so it wants to rise just like a hot air balloon would rise. And as that happens, these bubbles start to form. And as it gets closer and closer and closer to the surface, the bubbles get bigger and bigger and bigger. So the analogy to the beer is you can actually see this in your own beer. Now, I've been at conferences with other volcanologists, and we'll go after the conference and have a beer. And without a doubt, every time somebody points out the bubbles in the beer and half of us are going, yeah, that's how it works. So <laughs> yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty nerdy. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so you can actually see this process in your own beer. You can see the bubbles getting bigger as they get towards the surface of your beer because it's lowering pressure, right? Well, it gets to a point underneath the volcano where there are so many bubbles. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're taking more and more volume. And the actual magma is only making up this really thin film around the bubbles. So essentially, it's like blowing, foam or blowing uh, bubbles in your milk. You just get this big foam up there. But that's building a heck of a lot of pressure underneath that volcano. And eventually, it exceeds the strength of that volcano to hold it in. And it just, boom, you have an explosive eruption. Um, so this is just depicting what happens down here. Your bubbles get too big, and they break. And they shoot out of the volcano as ash. So ash is, in essence, pulverized lava. Okay, So if there was no gas in there, you would just have lava coming out. But because there's gas, it blows it into smithereens. So that's how you get an explosive eruption. And as a Mount St. Helens example, it began explosive, but then over time, after the eruption continued, it kind of let off all of its gas. My fizzy water lost its fizzy, and you just had a, <laughs> a lava dome form in the crater. So it's hard sometimes for people to, um, to grasp how these lava domes grow. So this is just a time-lapse video of the most recent eruption at Mount St. Helens just to demonstrate the difference between those explosive eruptions and the actual growth of a lava dome. Now, these things happen very, very slowly. And if you stand at the crater, you can't actually see it growing, but it can be growing quite rapidly. So let's see if I can get this thing started here. All right, so focus in on this, this plug. You see how it's starting to move up? So this is a lava dome oozing out of the crater. And it doesn't look very hot, but it is quite hot. It's maybe around 700 degrees Celsius. Uh, and you can see it gets a little steep, and then it collapses off. It migrates. So this is over a two-year period. Yeah. So, yeah, kind of like a shark fin there. So 
So these eruptions, these volcanoes, they blow their top. They blow off a huge chunk of the mountain, so they're very destructive. But then in the end, they become constructive because they start to build up a lava dome, which can build the volcanoes back up to their peaks. All right. So can anybody tell me what volcano this is? Shasta, Rainier, Adams. Did I hear St. Helens? This is Mount St. Helens. This is Mount St. Helens before the eruption in 1980, okay? Yep. So I believe this is looking from uh, Johnston Ridge right here. And you see all the, the old growth forest down here. So my question to you now is, if you were a volcanologist and somebody told you that there could be signs of unrest at this volcano, it, there's some earthquakes underneath of it, it, it might erupt. How are you going to determine if this is going to be an explosive eruption or a non-explosive eruption? Yeah, there's a huge bulge on the side of it, and we're actually going to show that in a couple of slides when I get into the story part of it. But look for gas. Okay, so gases might be coming out telling you that there's gas in the magma. Earthquakes. Earthquakes. So these are all things that are telling you the volcano is going to erupt. So swelling, earthquakes, gas. But how do you know how it's going to erupt? We know it's going to erupt, but how? Is it going to be explosive or non-explosive? History. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So you go and you look at the rocks. You see what happened last time it erupted. And when you go look, you see that there are these mud flows. You see that there are these ash falls, meaning that it was explosive. And so if you look at the history of Mount St. Helens, you'll see that it's been dominantly explosive. Almost every eruption, every eruption that I know of that ever started at Mount St. Helens was incredibly explosive. It's one of the most explosive volcanoes in the Cascades. So to figure out what's going to happen, you go and look at the history of it. You go see what happened last time, because most likely that's what's going to happen again. Past performance is a, a very good indicator for... Not like the stock market, is that what you said? <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to get into the uh, actual presentation of this. And if you have questions or want to interject or anything like that during this, feel free. And then we'll take a break and we can uh, have a discussion session. So um, as I said, oh, yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. So the question was, is there a difference? Is one of the differences between these two volcanoes the fact that over here we're at a subduction zone where you actually have the oceanic plate subducting or sinking underneath the continental plate? And as it dives down underneath the continental plate, there's some melting, and that's what causes volcanism here, as opposed to Hawaii, where you actually have a completely different system. You've got this this hot spot coming up from deep within the earth, this huge amount of heat rising. So that is a reason. Uh, why you get very different style of volcanism. Um, and if you want, we could get into that in, in great detail during the discussion. Absolutely, absolutely. That is, is completely, yeah, absolutely. So it, the question was, that, is there any way that you could use to predict what kind of activity you're going to get? And that, absolutely, yes. Um, in the Hawaiian-style hotspot, you've got something coming up through oceanic crust, which is only maybe seven kilometers, maybe, uh, what is that, seven kilometers thick, very, very thin, versus the crust, which is full of water and silica and all of these things that are going to contaminate that magma and put gas into it, in a sense. Uh, and the crust is 20, 30 kilometers thick. And so you get very different volcanism if it's coming up through the continental crust versus the very, very thin oceanic crust. And so that's absolutely uh, a huge factor in this as well. So. Yeah, so he said, what's your name? Right. Yeah, yeah. so exactly. So he pointed out that when Lewis and Clark came out here, the Native Americans at the time were actually telling them about past eruptions, and that's true. So when I say this current cone built in the last 2,200 years, I mean that in the last 2,200 years, there have been many, many, many eruptions. So what you see now has built very quickly in geologic time. So 2,200 years is very fast. But it's had many, many eruptions. So that brings us into our next slide here. 
So here is are the Cascade volcanoes all the way up here from Baker down to Lassen in California. Here's Mount St. Helens. And over here, you've got all of them listed. And every one of these little volcanoes shows how many times each of these volcanoes have erupted. And so you notice in the last 4,000 years, Mount St. Helens has erupted a lot. <laughs> OK. It's by far the most active volcano in the Cascades. And it roughly erupts every 100, 120 years. It's, it's pretty um, regular. Not all of them are regular, as you can see. We've got Hood here that's only erupted a couple of times. And uh, we've got Rainier that's only erupted about four times in the last 4,000 years. So, so yeah, it was a good, a good point. So the question is, so Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams are right next to each other here. And the question was, is Mount St. Helens, uh, what was your, how do you put it? Is it stealing Mount Adams' thunder? <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> that's a really good question. And if you look at the individual volcanoes, you see that they erupt different magmas, which would suggest that they have completely different magma chambers. So their magma chambers aren't connected. So you wouldn't really think that one of them is kind of relieving the pressure so that Mount Adams doesn't erupt because they actually are two different systems. But yeah, that's a really good question too. Any other questions? So Baker only uh, erupted once. Yep, in the last 4,000 years. So Mount Baker then would have erupted prior to that to build up the current edifice or the current volcano. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what accounts for the regularity? So why does Mount St. Helens erupt every 100 years versus these other ones that are kind of sporadic? And that's we really don't know. We really don't know. That's a very, very good question. And some volcanoes are so somewhat regular, and some are completely sporadic, and you have no time frame as to when they erupt. Um, it might have to do with how fast. It probably has to do with how fast their magma reservoirs can recharge. And what controls that? Could it be the same principle that makes Old Faithful so faithful? <laughs> uh, yeah, so Old Faithful in Yellowstone is a geyser. It's a hydrothermal feature, so it's very close to the surface. And basically what happens there is the water becomes pressurized. So Old Faithful blows all of the water out. Water seeps back in. It becomes pressurized. It gets to a point where the water's boiling, 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 and it vaporizes and explodes and, and Old Faithful goes again. So that's pretty regular because of the, the pressures and the, the way it's kind of um, constructed that it takes so long for that water to fill back up, reach the boiling point, get under that pressure, and then erupt again. Um, so it, that's more of a surface process, whereas these things are going on miles, miles deep. So probably not the same thing, but maybe conceptually, yeah, potentially, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go on with this presentation then. Oh, one more question. Yeah, so the question... So he was noticing that it looks like there have been a lot of volcanoes erupting the last 200 years versus not. If you took that line and you moved it over, there are quite a lot erupting here. There are quite a lot erupting here. So I don't think that means that we're becoming any less stable or more prone to eruptions. Um, it might be more of a coincidence. Um, I don't think over this time frame, the rate of subduction has, has changed that much, for example. So but good, good observation. Very good questions. Crater Lake down here in or or, uh, yeah in Oregon uh, last erupted well not in the far last far, I don't remember when it last erupted six thousand years ago wasn't it yeah so the huge eruption of Mazama yeah that all erupted again that system is not dead none of these volcanoes are extinct all of these are dormant uh, some of them are well actually a lot of them are considered active volcanoes even though they are not are currently erupting but that will erupt again. Mm -hmm. 
That's a, that's, you guys have some great <laughs> questions here. We don't even need this presentation. Let's talk volcanoes all night. Okay. <laughs> so the question was, in the 70s, Mount Baker, Mount Baker started stirring, meaning there was a bunch of gas that started coming out. There was a lot of seismicity. I believe there was even maybe some deformation, meaning the, the volcano was swelling, indicating that there may have been magma on the rise. And then it just stopped. And then nothing happened. It faked us out. It totally faked us out. So that what that could have been. So the magma, so we've got magma down in the surface that's that's generated, right? Only roughly 10% of magma that's generated under our feet ever makes it to the surface. And so what could have happened there is that you had magma coming up, coming up, coming up, and then it just never really made it. And it just stopped. And so, you know, only a, a small amount was making its way to the surface, and it just didn't have enough oomph to get up there and erupt. And that happens a lot. That if you look at the Aleutian Island volcanoes, that's happening all the time. You'll have increased seismicity, and then it'll just stop. And so you just have these intrusions that never make it to the surface. Yeah, so Yellowstone, one of the volcanoes that's near and dear to my heart, uh, Yellowstone is a scary beast. Yellowstone, the kinds of eruptions that you get at Yellowstone have a special name, super eruptions, right? They're mega colossal eruptions. That's actually a term, mega colossal, <laughs> okay? The <laughs> they dwarf, Mount St. Helens would be a pinprick compared to one of those eruptions. So Yellowstone is a very different system. It has a much, much, much bigger magma chamber sitting underneath of it. So it takes a really long time for that magma chamber to build up. And it seems to have erupted explosively every maybe 650,000 years. And that's where you have those, I mean, you're gaping. You, you, you erupt so much magma that you leave a huge void in the subsurface under the ground, and it collapses in on itself. And so that creates that eight-mile-wide caldera that you have. At you know, if you're inside, if you're in Yellowstone National Park, you're inside a volcano. You don't even know it because it's completely collapsed. Um, but like I said before, when I was talking about Mount St. Helens, was to figure out what's going to happen next. You look at the most recent activity. And 600,000 years ago, that volcano erupted explosively with one of the most explosive eruptions on our planet. But since then, it's erupted many, 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 many times with small, small eruptions. Just lava flows in the crater, some small explosive eruptions. So if Yellowstone erupts again, it will most likely be a smaller eruption. However, that being said, a mega colossal eruption is probably in its future eventually. But there are a lot of things that we don't understand about, about that system. So, Okay, so I'm going to go on to the Mount St. Helens story. So I don't want to keep you guys here till midnight. Um, and then we can continue this great discussion. Okay, so here we are. First, I'm going to talk about the awakening of Mount St. Helens, how it started to stir. And before that, you guys are pretty familiar from your, this discussion about how we monitor volcanoes, right? So this is just kind of a cartoon of some volcanologists out here. Uh, so if a volcano starts to stir, some things happen. If there's magma moving in the, in the under the ground, it's movement. It's, it's moving up. It's Coming up through fractures, it's moving. Any movement is going to cause an earthquake. And these earthquakes aren't something that we can feel, but our, our seismometers can feel them. They're very tiny, but you have increased earthquakes underneath the volcano if there's magma moving. You also have it, uh, higher gases coming out of the volcano. So if, if magma is coming up and it's got gas in it, some of that gas is actually able to escape. And so you might have an increase in your gas emissions at the volcano. And so you can monitor that with these kind of special equipment or looking at the water. Uh, and then also, you have deformation. If, if you have magma coming up into a system, well, it's going to swell. It's like putting water into a balloon. It's going to it's, it's gonna deform. It's going to swell up, uh, which is exactly what happened at Mount St. Helens. So these are the ways that people monitored uh, the eruption. So it... The eruption, well, okay, so the unrest, I should say. The awakening of the volcano started with earthquakes. These started back here in March. So in early March or mid-March, all of a sudden you get this kind of a little increase in earthquakes, and you get a little bit more earthquakes, and then bam, 
you're getting a lot of earthquakes. Their seismometers, the seismographs were just completely black with earthquakes. And so very rapid increase in earthquakes. The first explosion happened in March. So the big eruption happened in May, but there are some explosions before that. March through April, you had these steam explosions, which are similar to the old faithful type of explosions. And what's happening is magma is moving to the surface. It's not quite to the surface yet, but there's water in that volcano. There's just groundwater, normal water sitting down in the cracks of the volcano. Well, it gets heated up very quickly when that magma is rising towards the surface, and essentially you vaporize it, and it causes these small steam explosions. And so you had steam explosions, and this is very common before a, a, a large-scale eruption. So you had these steam explosions, sometimes called phreatic explosions, for a couple months leading up to the eruption. Uh, through up to May, intensity of the earthquakes increased, the phreatic of the steam explosions increased, and 10,000 earthquakes were recorded in mid through mid-May. That's, that's, that's a lot of earthquakes. Um, and you can see here this picture, there are all these fractures in the flanks here because of the earthquakes and because of the, the steam explosions. No. Yeah, so hikers and climbers, were they still going up? No, at this point, uh, I, I the mountain's closed. <laughs> closed for business until further notice. So fractures potentially also do with the swelling of the mountain, sure, yeah. Um, All right, so with the swelling of the mountain, probably the most fantastic thing that happened prior to this eruption was the bulge. Now, let me point out how special this is, because usually when I'm talking about volcanoes swelling, I'm talking about millimeters, maybe a centimeter over time. This thing grew at five feet a day incredible rates. And so this is 1964, so this is Mount St. Helens before anything happened. Do you see this weird looking welt on here? That's the bulge. That's the swell, okay? And so what, <laughs> what, the, what the volcanologists did was they, uh, they sent their graduate students up onto the bulge. <laughs> <laughs> And they put a mirror on the bulge. And then they come down here and they stay at a safe distance and they shoot a laser at that mirror. And that can tell them how far they are from the mirror. Well, the next day they go back and they shoot a laser to the mirror. And the mirror's gone. It's gone. It's nowhere to be found. I mean, remember, these things are only supposed to be swelling millimeters. And so, you know, they're like, well, who the heck would go up there? So they, of course, send their graduate students back up there to get the mirror, put the mirror back in. And when the students got up, they saw, and I, I don't know if it was the students, it probably wasn't students, but when the volcanologists went back up there, they saw that the mirror was there, but it was moved like several feet. And so they realized, oh my gosh, this thing, there's no way, this has got to be wrong. So they started recognizing that the movement of the volcano was so much, the swelling of the volcano was so much more than what they're used to seeing. Um, and indeed, it was swelling. Here's a better picture of, of it here. It was swelling at five feet a day, and over the, you know, between the time that it started and the eruption, it actually grew 460 feet. So this is an enormous amount of swelling. S yeah, question? Yeah, so now we have much better ways to monitor swelling with satellites and GPS units, and we can get it down to like tenths of millimeters. Uh, so now we have much more sophisticated techniques. Uh, but this eruption is one of the best studied explosive eruptions of all times, and because of it, we know so much more about this kind of system and how to monitor them. All right, so along with this swelling, what do you think is happening to this volcano? <laughs> it's becoming pretty unstable, right? I mean, you're, you're moving this rock pretty quickly, and it's becoming very, very unstable. It's becoming oversteepened. So this continues to swell until May 18th. So the morning of May 18th, beautiful, clear day. How many people were here and remember the eruption? It's fantastic. If you guys want to share your experience during the discussion session, I welcome you. I'd love to hear your experience. So that might be an interesting talking point as well. So what started this particular eruption? Was it, well, the eruption didn't start because the volcano finally built up enough pressure that it exploded. What happened was there was an earthquake. There was a tectonic earthquake, so a bigger earthquake than associated with normal volcanoes. There was an earthquake somewhere deep underneath the volcano. And because that bulge was so 
because the volcano was so weak because of that bulging, the volcano collapsed. Okay, so what we have in this diagram here, you see that this red stuff is this intrusion of magma. So the magma is coming up, a lot of it. It's getting stuck under the volcano. It can't get out, and it swells, 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 building up pressure, building up pressure, weakening that volcano. You have an earthquake. That weak part of the volcano slips right off. And what happens, so here's kind of a diagram. You can see it just slips off in these three gigantic slide blocks. And it exposes that magma. As soon as it exposes that magma, it would be like me shaking up this pop and opening it and spraying myself. I mean, you just comp you really rapidly release all of that pressure, and boom, you get a huge explosion. 